Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently and had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to do two brief profiles tonight before we get into our main subjects. Our first profile is of Peter Dallin, who died recently at the age of 93. Peter Dallin was one of the great swim coaches in American history. He coached USC for 35 years. He was called the John Wooden of swimming. He coached the United States women in the 1964 Olympics, and they won six gold medals. And he coached the U.S. men in the 1972 Games, and they won nine gold medals, including seven by Mark Spitz. He was Mark Spitz's coach there. One of his first great swimmers was Murray Rose, who came from Australia to be coached by him. We did Murray Rose's podcast a couple years ago. Murray Rose was probably the greatest swimmer in the world in the early 1960s. 1960s, and he heard about this young swim coach from California, so he decided to come to USC. In all, he coached seven Olympians and 392 All-Americans. In the 35 years he coached at USC from 1958 to 1992, his teams won nine national titles and placed second 11 times. And in addition to that, he was the founder of Swimming World magazine. So we've lost one of the great swimming coaches in American history, the John Wooden of Swimming, Peter Dallin from USC. We're going to move on with a brief mention of Raphael Ravenscroft, who died recently at the age of 16. He was a saxophone player who did one of the great sax solos in rock history. And actually, I've told this story before in 2011 when I did the Jerry Rafferty podcast. Jerry Rafferty was a Scottish musician. He was a friend of Billy Connolly's. And in 1978, he came out with a record called Baker Street. It would have been an unremarkable record, except they were looking for a sax player to do a solo. Raphael Ravenscroft was an itinerant player at the time with a lot of talent. They picked him up, and this is what he added to a record that might have otherwise gone unnoticed. Ironically, Raphael Ravenscroft said that that was out of tune when he recorded it, but Baker Street went to number three in the UK and number two in the United States, and it sold millions across the world. Jerry Rafferty made a lot of money off that record. I think he made about $100,000 a year in royalties on it. He blew it all on liquor and good times, and he died about three years ago. Raphael Ravenscroft, on the other hand, got a check for 27 pounds, about $40, and even that check bounced, so he just had it framed and hung it in his office. He said if he'd gotten big money, he probably would have blown it like Jerry Rafferty did. But on the basis of that sax solo from Baker Street, he became an in-demand saxophonist. In 1990, he published a successful instruction book called The Complete Saxophone Player. In 2011, he recorded a tribute to commemorate Jerry Rafferty's funeral. And last summer, he organized a charity gala concert in memory of a local schooler who died after falling from a wall in his hometown. So he had a pretty good life after that, even if he didn't make a fortune from that famous sax solo from Baker Street. Move on now to a guy who was the exact opposite. He had a fortune, and he tried to make more, and it didn't work. Nelson Bunker Hunt, Bunky Hunt, who died recently at the age of 88. He was one of the two sons of H.L. Hunt, the oil magnet, and he was a Texas oil guy himself. And he's famous for one thing. In 1979, he tried to corner the world market in silver, and he almost got away with it. After the Shah fell in Iran in 1979, Bunky Hunt got together with some of the Arab oil sheiks, and they put together a huge amount of money, and they bought about 60% of a year's worth of the silver market, and the price of silver went way up. The market figured out what he was doing, the regulators figured out what he was doing, they put in some new rules, and all of a sudden, the price of silver plunged. He had to meet a margin call. He didn't meet it either because he couldn't, or he didn't figure that the price would go so low. And he lost over a billion dollars, and he lost more in fines. There are no tag days for Bunky Hunt. He still did okay after that. And after that, he was just your run-of-the-mill Texas oil millionaire, and he carried the reputation for the rest of his life as the man who almost cornered the market in silver. Here's a report from England on Bunky Hunt and his attempts to corner the silver market. Silver has always been regarded as poor man's gold. And as gold continued to climb on the back of ultra-loose monetary policy, many investors were drawn to silver as a cheaper alternative and a store of value, and the price shot up. 
But silver took a big tumble, in part driven by increased margin calls, leaving many investors nursing big losses. And that, in turn, has sparked a renewed interest in another silver crash, Silver Thursday, at a Texan named Bunker Hunt. Here's Philip Lasker. The super wealthy Duke brothers in the Paramount film Trading Places... How can the place be going down? Something's wrong. ...were wiped out after unsuccessfully trying to corner the market for frozen orange juice. The characters were inspired by Texas oil millionaire Nelson Bunker Hunt and his brother when they tried to corner the silver market in the 1970s. Bunker was the first one that really felt the wrath of political powers, not liking people to have concentrated long positions in a, in, in, a, in a smallish market that has political consequences. And the silver market is certainly a market that back in the 1970s and 80s certainly had political consequences in terms of its the way it makes the fiat or paper currency regimes be perceived by the general public. The Bunker Hunts tried to corner the silver market to protect their wealth, they were paranoid about inflation as U.S. President Richard Nixon moved the currency away from the gold standard. I don't really keep track of, uh, of uh, never, never count my money. I just want to enjoy life and uh, I don't have to spend a lot of money to enjoy life. Bunker Hunt joined forces with Saudi millionaires to become the market's biggest player, buying up to 60% of an entire year's silver supply during 1979. The price skyrocketed from $6 US an ounce to $52 in a year. Then, in early 1980, investors fled from silver as gold tumbled and a credit squeeze took hold. Bunker Hunt ignored a margin call from his broker, Beish, so they asked the regulator, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, to shut the market or force Hunt to pay up. They advised me that morning that they had word from the Bank of England that if they stopped trading, it would be considered by the European market as a very bearish point of view. So regulators, fearing a global meltdown, did nothing. Silver prices collapsed in March 1980, costing Bunker Hunt $2 billion as he failed to meet his margin calls. It has made people far more aware of the speculative, sometimes dangerously speculative nature of these markets. It will therefore make them more cautious. Somebody will try it again sometime. We're going to move on to our feature tonight, Oscar de la Renta. He died recently at the age of 82, and he was the Dominican dress designer who designed dresses for first ladies, movie stars, and high society. He started out working for Balenciaga. He worked for Lan Van and Balmain. In the early 60s, he was designing dresses for Jackie Kennedy. Vogue and Diana Vreeland picked him up. And after that, his name became synonymous with high fashion. Here's a report on Oscar de la Renta. Oscar de la Renta, one of the most sought-after fashion designers of the last half century, has died. Born in the Dominican Republic, de la Renta made a name for himself in the 1960s. De la Renta was known as one of the industry's classic designers, famous for his floral patterns and feminine silhouettes. Besides Hollywood starlets, he dressed several first ladies, including Nancy Reagan and Laura Bush. I feel very privileged lucky that I have had a wonderful life and that I have been always allowed to do what I love. I always say that to me my role as a designer is to do the very best I can for that woman, to make her feel her very best. When you look at Oscar's clothes, you know it's an Oscar and one of the things that it does is make you beautiful. This incredibly elegant man who has so much talent, he makes a woman look like a woman, feel like a woman, feel like a princess. He has that old-fashioned elegance, and yet he is able to interpret it in such a modern way. This is Oscar de la Renta. The foundation of his work is great dressmaking and craftsmanship. Yet when you see an Oscar de la Renta dress, you see the woman first, and the dress only complements her beauty and her personality. And a smile. You know, I always tell the girls, smile, because of I hate sad faces. Oscar just adores seeing women wearing his clothes and feeling good and looking fantastic. What counts is now and the immediate future, not the past. I never look back, I always look forward. He was a witty, charming guy and he was a great interview. So I'm going to play a little bit of a couple of interviews with him. Here he talks a little bit about his mentor, Balenciaga. I think Balenciaga probably was one of the greatest designers of the 20th century, no question about it. I think that there are different types of designers. 
you know, there are survivors like me, and then there are designers who so strongly marked a period of fashion that they could never get out of it. And I see that in, 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 in fashion, the most important thing is all the time to move on. Here are three of his clients known by their first names, Jackie, Ava, and Marilyn. Marilyn or Jackie? Do I have to choose either one? Yeah. I like Eva Garn, but I like brunettes, you know. Uh -huh. So I nice saw that Eva was one of the most beautiful women that I've ever met. When you were very, very young in Madrid, you saw her. You was you were... way up on the the less expensive ticket, at the bull ring, and I saw that the bullfighter came and put his cape in front of, and all of a sudden I said, "What's going on?" And he said, "That's Eva Garner. and I left before the. The corrida ended to be sure that I will see uh, Eva perhaps. And there was suddenly she was running with three photographers running after her. And there was suddenly I find myself face to face with her. And I say, My name is Jose de la Renta, and I come from San Domingo. And she said, Oh, sweet. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. He was a citizen of both the United States and the Dominican Republic. And in the Dominican Republic, he started a charity for children where he adopted his son. I started an orphanage so totally by accident. A lady came to me and asked me if I would I would help her. And we started with a little school. And then um, I fell in love with it. They light up when he arrives. I mean, it's just a magical moment. It's comprehensive medical care, all kinds of social support services. And Oscar's really involved. He even adopted his son, Moises, out of that house. But I never thought that I would adopt a child, it, it just happened. The only one thing that I'm very sure about Moses, and my only ambition for Moses, was that he would be a good-hearted man, and that he is. And finally here, Oscar de la Renta gives you some of his life philosophy. What is important in, in human relations is that when there is the dialogue, that's the most important thing. Yeah. I have a creative blog on a daily basis. To be a good designer, you have to keep your eyes open. You have to understand your consumer. You have to understand the woman that you are addressing. And obviously, the woman that I address today is a very different woman than the woman when I started the business. But, you know, fashion is illusions. The project of that illusion and how good you are at, at projecting that, that illusion. Oscar De La Renta. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps, and we're going to close tonight with Tim Hauser, who died recently at the age of 72. Tim Hauser was the founder and guiding force behind the Manhattan Transfer. The group was formed in 1969. It was named after a John Dos Passos novel, and for the next 40 years, they were a hip, jazzy group with an urban sound, and they were popular all over the world. Here, Tim Hauser talks about his musical background. I've always been interested in singers, and like my, I asked my mom once, uh, you know, how when did I start singing? She said, as long as I remember you. But I got, I was into song stylists. That, that's what they call them. And they call them jazz singers now. But they're the song stylists in the 50s. This is around 1953, 4, and 5. Like uh, Sinatra and Tony Bennett, Dinah Washington, Ella, Sarah Vaughan, Al Hibbler. I was a big fan of Al Hibbler's. The Four Freshmen. I loved all that stuff. Jerry Southern. And because uh, I used to listen to WNEW in New York. I grew up in the New York metropolitan area. And then when I, when I got out of grade school and entered high school, I discovered rhythm and blues. And uh, I used to listen to Alan Freed, and I, I, I was just immersed in vocal groups. That was my love. All those uh, rhythm and blues vocal groups, what I, now they call doo-wop groups. I was a big fan of Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, and I met them in 1956. Heard them warm up a cappella in the dressing room before a concert, and that did it for me. That was the, the I, I, I would say, uh, Karmically, that was God hitting me with that lightning bolt going, here it is, kid. If you miss it, it ain't my fault. You know, here it is. And I, it was such an incredible experience. And I thought, this is what I want to do. Well, he didn't miss it. To close, I'm going to feature him singing with the Manhattan Transfer. I could have picked a lot of songs. But I thought I'd pick one of their best. It's a song that was written by Bobby Troop in 1946, and it has the distinction, at least I think the distinction, of being the only song covered by both Bing Crosby and the Rolling Stones. Route 66, here's Tim Hauser and the Manhattan Transfer. Get your kicks on Route 66. Get your kicks on Route 66. Say you 
Get your kicks on.